Get your Bibles out. You're going to need it. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. We'll get into the Word. I remember I was mad. I was angry at McDonald's. I'm not kidding you. When I was a boy, because when I'd go down, when we go down to visit kinfolk down in Arkansas, driving through Pocahontas without getting a ticket, and go, go to Jacksonville and Little Rock, my Meemaw, we'd go down there and she'd get up early every morning, fix everybody breakfast, you know, and and then if we went fishing, she always sent me a little sack, and in that sack was breakfast left. Anything left over from breakfast went between a biscuit. And that was my snack for later on. So McDonald's decides to start serving breakfast. And they put sausage and bacon and eggs on a biscuit. And I got mad because I went, they stole that idea from my Mima. I'm not, I'm not, I'm serious. I was angry. I'm going, they owe her money for that. I didn't know somebody else may have thought of it too, you know, so. I thought it was her exclusive rights that, I thought, what a genius thing. So anyway, uh, Romans chapter one, we are looking at doctrine. And is that important? Absolutely. Because you are surrounded by idiots. You're surrounded. I didn't mean here. I meant on in the world and online, you are surrounded by raving lunatics. And every false way that has been invented by hell and the devil has now gained strongholds all over the world because of the Internet. And more and more and more people are believing lies than ever before. And so I think it's important that we arm ourselves with Bible knowledge. Now, this may not, this may not thrill you, but let me, let me help you out with something in life. You want wisdom to make it through the areas of life that you need to get through, but you cannot get wisdom except you get knowledge and understanding first. When you know how God works, then you will understand how God works and then you will just sit back and let God work. That's the wisdom of life. Amen. So we're looking at issues of salvation. How is it that God takes a sinner who has broken and violated his law and gives them the right to go free and live free in eternity in heaven. How is it that God does that? What are the rules? What are the guidelines? Does God just save everybody who's ever lived? Does God just save them all? And so he transports everybody into heaven. Is that how it works? No. God selects people who select him. It's kind of a cycle there or a circle but that's roughly how it works but how then does god select these people in other words what is the mechanism so let let's say let me give you this let's say that uh, let's say that brother sterling uh went on a rampage and just started killing people right and left all right and they arrest him and they put him in jail find him guilty He's going to get 20 consecutive life sentences. So when he dies the first time, he's got to spend another lifetime in jail. And then 19 more times after that. So then a week later, you see him walk in the streets. And you're going, they found him guilty. How is it that he's out walking the streets now? This man's a murderer. How does that happen? How is it that you will be able to walk on streets made of pure gold? Because you're a sinner. You broke the law of God. So how does that work? Paul said in Romans chapter 1 verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So last week, what we were establishing was, and just a couple more verses in this area, we were establishing God's consistency in salvation. If God saves one man a certain way, the Bible teaches that God saves 
every man the exact same way. I, you know, you heard me say this before. I, I've actually sat across the table. I can remember it like it was yesterday of a man that me and a, a, a deacon out at Richwoods, we, we went to his wife, came to church, but he never did. His daddy raised him to be, you know, this rugged individualist that didn't need anybody's help, didn't need God, didn't need anything. And I sat across the table in front of him and I said, Mitch, tell me, how is it that you think that you're going to go to heaven? And he said, well, me and God had kind of worked out my own deal. He said, I believe that my good deeds are going to outweigh my bad deeds. Now, this is a man whose wife told me later on that she knew that he had a, a big, huge, you know, one of them chests, big box, you know, a big chest, you know, with a lock on it and stuff like that. He had one of those Full of pornographic magazines. Full of it. And he'd had it for years. And he just kept adding to his collection. This man believed that whatever good deeds he did would outweigh his covetousness and his lust in his mind against his marriage and toward everybody else. He believed that. That's what he believed. Well, that man just, it just turns out that man just needed to be taught because uh, we started a, a, like a home Bible study there with the people in that church. And lo and behold, he started coming and he started listening to the actual gospel and he got saved. Found out he was wrong. I sat across from Steve Leonard one night, Sterling, and Steve told me. This was before I even started working with you guys. He told me, he said, me and God got our own, we got our own deal going. You know, I can be just as close to God out fishing and hunting as I can in any church. In fact, I'm, I'm closer to God out there than I am in any church. That's what he told me. But his life was so full of sin and disobedience. He thought that he could work out his own deal with God where God would let him hunt, fish, mess around, drink, do everything in the world that's wrong. But God finally got him one day. Because he heard the real gospel. And he knew he wasn't right with God. Bless God, he's in heaven tonight. Because God changed his mind on that. And the, what I'm telling you is, if you're one of those that thinks that you worked out your own deal with God, my question to you is, who in the world do you think you are? Because if God saves, a, God saves any man one way, he saves every man the exact same way. And by by way, I'll add this to it. What makes you think you got enough good deeds? What makes you think that? So that's what he's saying here. For it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. How God saves Jews, those are his chosen people. How God saves them is how he saves us. Aren't you glad that even though God chose a people for himself called the nation of Israel... That he demands from them, as far as salvation, the exact same thing that he demands of us who are not his people. I mean, most organizations in the world, if you're not their kind of people, you get treated differently than the people who are their kind of people. You know what I'm talking about? There's a lot of ways that happens. But I'm just saying to you, if God saves somebody one way, he saves everybody the same way. God is consistent in how he saves people. Romans chapter 2, turn there. Look in your Bible, Romans chapter 2, verse 9. The Bible talks about how tribulation and anguish is upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. Now I'm going to flip that around. Just because the Jews are God's chosen people does not mean that when they sin, God gives them a free pass on it. But he makes the Gentiles suffer tribulation for it. Aren't you glad of that? That not only does God give them the grace and us the grace free, but when they have turned their hearts against God and they sin against God, God doesn't treat them, the Jews, any different than in fact... I kind of think that God is meaner to the Jews than he is to the rest of the world because 
He took them through the wilderness, showed them all of his miracles. My goodness, the Jews got up every day for 40 years and saw a substance on the ground that no man has ever seen since that time. And it was the manna and that's how God fed them. They saw the Red Sea open up. They saw the, the glory uh, cloud of God there over the tabernacle. They saw the pillar of fire by night. They saw the quails come in. I mean, they saw miracles. And yet, they constantly turned their back on God. God finally had enough of it. So what I'm saying to you is, there isn't one man on this earth any different than anybody else. When it comes to sin, and when it comes to salvation. So verse 10, glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles for there is, underline this in your Bible, there is no respect of persons with God. Underline that, somebody ought to make a bumper sticker. Put it on every car in America. There is no respect of persons with God. Make you out a card and send it to every member of Congress and every judge and every rich person who thinks that they're better than everybody else, who think their money can buy their way to salvation, send that to them and say, God does, God, there's, God does not respect persons. Amen? So God is consistent. Romans 10, verse 12. You're in Romans. Turn over a couple more chapters. Romans 10, verse 12. For there's no difference. There is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich Unto all that call upon him. In fact, the very next verse, what is it? Romans 10, 13. What does that say? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So it doesn't matter if it's John or Melissa. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if it's me or sweetie pie. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's Cubby or Cindy. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they're black or white or red or yellow. What other colors are there? Brown. Whatever. Doesn't matter. They're all made out of dirt anyway. And it doesn't matter to God. God is rich and God gives mercy to all. Galatians 3, 28, for there is neither Jew nor Greek, for there is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Somebody say amen. So, and I, I'm going to throw this in too. Does it matter who you are when you pray? And I have people, oh, pastor, pray for me. I want you to pray for me. I'll pray for you. We have a live on a pastor praying for me. Why? I mean, God hears my prayers, yes. But why wouldn't God hear your prayers? So that's some of that overtones from some of these churches where they put the clergy up higher than everybody else. And it's not just the Catholic church. It's a lot of churches where they put the clergy up over everybody else and say, oh, the clergy, boy, they're close to God. They pray all the time. Surely God will listen to them. God will listen to you too. The Bible says of Elijah that he was a man of like passions as you and I. He was absolutely no different than you and I. And yet he prayed one time and it didn't rain for three and a half years. He prayed one time and then it started raining. So I'm just telling you, there's no difference. God, don't, God is not a respecter of persons. Colossians 3.11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, and I'll add redneck, Hoosier, whatever, city boy, whatever, suburban, doesn't matter who you are, where you live, how tall you stand, whether you sit or stand, lay down, it doesn't matter, God to heal everybody, somebody say amen. Bond no free, but Christ is all and in all. I mean, look at the members of your body. Look at the members of your body. Each member is different, significantly different than any other member of your body. But God, it is all part of the same body. They're all controlled by the same head. 
When I eat, the whole of my body benefits from what I eat. T tongue first. <laughs> Which is why I do it. When I breathe, the whole of my body is benefited by the breath that the head gives to the body. When I, when I breathe or when my heart pumps blood, the whole of my body is benefited by that blood. And it's the same way in Christ. Doesn't matter. God's consistent. Somebody say amen. Now, concerning salvation, I'm going to deal with this. I had heard uh, all my life of what is called dispensationalism. I am not, I've been told I was a dispensationalist. I just don't know it. Well, I just don't like titles. I don't like names. You want to accuse me of something, accuse me of believing the Bible because that's what I believe. Okay? I believe God loves Israel. I believe God loves the Gentiles. But I want to say this. There's, that's why I spent all this time. There's one way of saving both Jew and Gentile. One way only. And so, what, ha what it is, there are those who are, they call them or they call themselves hyper dispensationalists. There is, Hypers, I guess, in just about every doctrinal idea, there are those who are sort of like the middle of the road. And there are extremes of just about anything everywhere. I mean, I believe when you get saved, you ought to be water baptized. Amen? There's extremes in that and where they say that you must be water baptized. If you're not water baptized, you're not saved. I don't believe that. I don't think the Bible teaches that. But I think when you get saved, I think you ought to get water baptized. Amen. That's, that's what the, Jesus did it. He told us to do it. And I think that's what, we did. by the way, Todd, thank you. It's white now. Huh? I come through here during the day. During the day, it looked blue. Lindsay asked, what, Courtney said, how come dad decided to put blue paint in there? It was just the way the light was hitting it, I guess. But anyway, but I think you ought to be water baptized. But. God does not require splashing water on somebody's face in order for them to be saved. Amen. So there are those who are hyper dispensationalists who limit now where our doctrine can come from. And I've read some of their doctrinal statements. I've done some research on this. There are some who say we are Paul only, only Paul. Now, if you know anything about your Bible, what I just said you know the Apostle Paul addressed that very issue. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he said in verse 12, Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I have Christ. Is Christ divided? Because there's this group that says, Our doctrine only comes from the writings of Paul, period. So it limits them to about 13 books in the Bible. And they say the rest of it, see, we're the only ones rightly dividing. The rest of it belongs to Israel or it belongs to these people in this particular time period. And I'm going to show you from the Bible, no. No. When you read your Bible, you're reading the Bible. The Word. Uh, that's why he calls it in many places, singular, the Word of God. God. Singular. In fact, uh, what is it? First Peter 1 Peter 1.23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. He kept it in the singular form so as to make no misunderstanding that it's the whole, the whole of the word of God. So where can and should our doctrine come from? And this would be applied then to everything that I would teach after this. Is that where can we believe what we believe? Now I'm going to add this to it right now. If it's not in the Bible, don't trust it. I showed on Pastor Mike online yesterday, I showed something. That... The advancements of video, I even saw some things today that just, I mean, it floors me. Computers now are learning to mimic human beings in every way. And Sterling, computers now can generate a face, 
a picture of a face and when you look at it, you would swear that that's somebody real, but it's computer generated and you cannot tell that it's, you cannot tell the difference. And they, there's a website called this person does not exist.com. And if you go there, it'll come up, you'll see a face and it looks like somebody's face. You hit refresh, it'll generate another face and it looks like somebody's face. But the deal is it, that person never exists. That person's not real. Now they have the ability with video, with video of take, they had a, a video of Barack Obama, a video of Barack Obama saying things that Barack Obama never said. They took words from some other source and made the video of Barack Obama say those words in his voice. Yes, David. Yeah. Absolutely. So let me, let me boil this down. I can take, I can get a computer and make a video of my son, Matthew, holding three children in his arms and him saying, these are my children from my second wife. And all of a sudden another woman shows up and those are not his children, that's not his wife, and that's not his voice, and it's not his lips saying it. They can do that now. That's scary. Because you're going to see things on the internet that are not real. They're not real. Yeah, the image, the voice, the face, the mannerisms, and it's going to, the technology is going to get better and better and better. I mean, we've seen movies where robots show up and you think you're talking to your Uncle Ned or something like that. And it's a, we're getting there. And here's what I'm saying. We're fastly moving into a world now where you can't trust anything in this world. You can trust nothing anymore. Documents can be generated. Faces can be generated. Voices can be generated. Things can be said that were never said. People can be, uh, can be created out, literally out of thin air that never existed before. David was holding up his Bible back there. There's one thing in this world that you can trust. One thing only. And I want to tell you, if you, if, even if you're on the, on the fence of, well, I, I kind of think the Bible's right, but you know, I've been told that there's mistakes in the Bible. I'm telling you, if you can't trust the Bible, what have you got left in this world? Let God be true and every man a liar. So I'm saying to you, it's the, if it's not in the Bible, I wouldn't believe it. If it's not the Bible, I would not believe it. I would not trust anything in this world, in this age, where anything can be manipulated and duplicated. I would not trust anything in this world except your Bible. So if the Bible says it, I would believe it if I were you. First Peter 1. Now, I want to throw this in too. How smart do you have to be when it comes to the Bible? Not very as is evidenced by the people who sit in this church every week, including your pastor. I mean, God gives us understanding. Don't get me wrong. He teaches us things. But he didn't say you had to know perfectly everything in the Bible. He said you had to believe it. I believe it. You know what I believe, Brother George? I believe God created the universe 6,000 years ago and he did it in six, six days, morning to evening, six days. Exactly six days. Now, they've got all this evidence that says that's not true. It can't be true. I don't care. I believe the Bible. Amen. Period. 1 Peter 1.10 Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of that grace that should come unto you. Now, here's what Peter's saying. He's saying the very grace that comes to us in this age 
was the very same grace that you read about in the Old Testament. Because there's some groups, even the, the Church of Christ does not believe in the, that the Old Testament has any doctrine or relevance for us now in this age. The hyper-dispensationalists believe that. There's nothing in the Old Testament that has any relevance to us today, so we don't get our doctrine from there. I'm telling you, Peter said, the very grace that comes to us, the Old Testament spoke of it. Meaning it's in the Old Testament. So, let me just give you an example. How is it that Noah and his family were saved when everybody else in the world perished in the days of flood? How was Noah saved? Ephesians 2 says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And the very thing that you learn about Noah before God ever said anything to Noah about building an ark, the Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So it was by grace that Noah was saved. Now he believed God, did he not? What was the evidence that Noah believed God? What was the factual evidence that Noah believed God? He built an ark. He believed God. He said, boys, we got work to do. We got an ark to build. Amen. Acts chapter 10, verse 43. To him, meaning Jesus Christ, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Now that verse we just read a while ago in Romans 10, 13, where it says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you know where that verse came from? It came from the Old Testament. In the book of Joel. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, the very grace that we believe in, you're not just going to find it in what Paul said. You're going to find it all through the Bible. If you'll be honest. Romans 3.21 But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Let me give you, I'm going to show you how this works. The, the doctrine of the substitutional atonement. Let me explain that. Let me break that down in simple words. It basically says that, okay, Matthew and Caleb, they were in the house. And let's say that Matthew broke his mom's cabinet with all her um, precious moments trinkets in it that I've bought for her over the years. Broke every single one of them. I mean, broke them in thousands of pieces. He's in big trouble. Caleb feels sorry for Matthew because Matthew's sitting there crying. <laughs> Caleb feels sorry for him. And when Lisa comes in, Caleb says, Mom, I broke your cabinet and all your precious moment stuff. I'll pay for every one of them. And Matthew gets off scot-free. That is what is we refer to as the substitutionary atonement. In other words, a substitute was in the place of condemnation. So in the Old Testament, if, if Todd sinned, in the Old Testament, he would come to the tabernacle bringing a lamb on a rope. And he would say to the priest, this is for my sins. The priest would then take that lamb and sacrifice it for his sins. What did the lamb do wrong? Nothing. Lamb did absolutely nothing. Lamb can't do anything wrong. So the lamb had to pay the penalty for his sins. So the same the same thing that you see in the Old Testament, that same principle, now exhibited in Christ. I am the sinner that should be condemned to death for my sins. And yet now Christ, the Lamb who has done nothing wrong, goes to stand in my place and receive the punishment of death for my transgressions. Woo! I know it's middle of the week and 
You're kind of tired and it's been a long week, but you ought to, that ought to make you smile a little bit. I don't have to pay for my sins. Christ did that for me. That is the substitutionary atonement. That's what he's saying. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The law provided a substitute to bear your iniquities so that you could be free from the justice and the judgment of your iniquities. They were foreshadowing Christ standing in your place and he did nothing wrong. So can we understand salvation even from the Old Testament? Yes. With the wisdom of the New Testament applied to it. You can see it. You see, but the Jews, what, what Bible do they read? Old Testament. That's being half blind. And they cannot understand all of those laws because they cannot see that Christ is the fulfillment of all of those laws. They cannot see it. That's why most Jews do not get saved unless God opens their eyes. Romans chapter 16, turn there. Romans 16. Verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all the nations for the obedience of faith. He says this is made manifest by the scriptures of the prophets. On the first day of the church, the day of Pentecost, who preached the first sermon of the first day? Who preached that sermon? Peter did. Where did he preach it from? The Old Testament, the book of Joel. As Peter and James and John are witnessing and testifying of the grace of Jesus Christ and they're preaching to the multitudes, where are they preaching it from? The Old Testament. As the, the men who were walking with Christ, you remember that deal after Christ rose from the dead? He's on the road, what was it, the road to... Huh? No? No, not Damascus, that was Paul. But these two guys are walking down the road going home. All of a sudden Jesus shows up with them. And they start talking about, did you hear about Jesus? And Jesus then, from, from Adam to Moses, through all the prophets, began to show those guys Jesus Christ. And he sat down and ate supper with them, and all of a sudden he vanished from their sight. And all of a sudden then they realized, they went, oh, that was Jesus. And then they stood, their minds are reeling, and they're going on about all that he said. And they said, everything he said, it makes sense now, because... Everything in the Bible points to Jesus. When Philip met the Ethiopian eunuch there in the chariot, what was the eunuch reading? Was he reading purpose-driven church? He's reading from Isaiah. And he, he said, I don't know who this is talking about. Philip said, let me tell you who it's talking about. And he showed him from the Old Testament, Christ. So don't give me any kind of nonsense that you think that you can't find salvation in the Old Testament. It's every... Oh, my goodness, I'm getting excited. It's everywhere. We're good. We're all right. Amen. Well, yeah, this thing cost me a fortune. <laughs> Gotta hang on to it. But he said it's made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. I, I challenge you, find the, you know the Romans road, right? Romans 3, 23, Romans 6, 23, Romans 10, 9 and 10, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 1 John 1, 9, John 3, 16. Find all that in the Old Testament. I guarantee you, you can do it and do it and read it just as good as if you're reading it from the New Testament. Because it's there. When you read, when you read this Old uh, this New Testament and get honest about it, you'll see the Old Testament being fulfilled. You'll see it all right there opened up to you. Man, I like that. Second Timothy 3.15, turn there. Underline this. This is very, very important. Very important. So, read, reading commentaries. Is that where you're going to find it? Listening, watching YouTube videos about the earth being flat. Is that where you're going to find it? 
reading websites, stacks and stacks of books. Wayne, when the hyper dispensationalists, they tried several years ago to straighten me out. They did. They said, Pastor Hoggard, your problem is you won't receive correction. I said, no, that's not my problem. I get corrected all the time. Every time I read the Bible, God corrects me about something. And they said, we have a library that we would love for you to get a hold of. It is all kinds of books written over the past 200 years about how you can only read the New Testament from doctrine. You need to get those books and read those books. And I said, no, thank you. If all of those books have to tell me to read only what Paul said in the New Testament, why don't I just read what Paul said in the New Testament? That would be easier, wouldn't it? But when you read Paul, Paul talks about what Moses said, what Jeremiah said, what David said. He's always going back to the Old Testament saying, it's right there, it's right there, it's right there, it's right there. 2 Timothy 3.15. 2 Timothy. That from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. Now, put yourself in Paul's position. He's, he's, this is, let's say it's A.D. 50. 50 A.D., 60 A.D., somewhere around in there. Okay? And he has this young man named Timothy. How much of the New Testament exists at this time? Not much. Not much. So when Paul said that he had the Holy Scriptures, what did Timothy have? He had the Old Testament. He didn't have the originals. He had copies. More than likely, he had the Greek translation of the Old Testament. But anyway, Paul called it the Holy Scriptures. And he said this to young Timothy, which are able to make thee wise unto what? Salvation. Timothy, read your Bible, which was Genesis through Malachi. Read it. That'll make you wise unto salvation, Timothy. You'll understand something. Because Timothy knew Jesus and he had the Holy Spirit. And he had Paul teaching him. So he was getting it filled in for him. But Paul told him, read your Bible. And as of that time, it was Genesis through Malachi. So then, verse 16. Now he says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Who has, who in here has a Thompson chain reference King James Bible? Does anybody have that? Thompson chain reference. In the middle of it, it's got a little strip down the middle of it with all these different notes and, te and verses and stuff like that. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. I have one upstairs I use for Pastor Mike online. It, it is, it's my notes Bible. It's got all my notes in it. I've had it for years. But in this very verse, it retranslates 2 Timothy 3.16. And it says in the margin, every inspired scripture is profitable. Scratch it out. Because that's not what it says. It says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for what? Doctrine. Can you find salvation in Genesis? Can you find salvation in Exodus? Of course you can. There's salvation in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Leviticus, special, Leviticus, you know, Leviticus has 27 chapters, 27 books in the New Testament. Leviticus is a proto-New Testament. Because Leviticus is all about the sacrifice for sins. It's all it's about. Okay? So all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. So if you want to correct me on something, don't send me somebody's book. Send me scripture verses. And don't mess around with them either. Because I'll know it if you do. Because I've got the originals right here. Okay. Correction, instruction in righteousness. How is it that we need to know how to live? This Bible teaches us how to live righteously. That the man of God may be perfect and truly furnished unto all good works. So I say this. That if you're going to be the man of God that God wants you to be, and you're going to do the things that God wants you to do, the things that God wants you to do are plainly written in the Bible for you. Roy and I was talking about this before church. He's got passages of scripture that really, he says it just really jumps out and it speaks my life. 
I said, yes, but Roy, the whole Bible is the book of Roy. And it's the book of Mike. And the book of Sterling. It's got, it's your life book. And everything that happens to you in life is in this book. And everything that God will have you to do is in this book. I wouldn't trust it if I couldn't see it in this book. Especially nowadays. Because there's a strong delusion coming, Cubby. Strong delusion. Very strong. And those... And I, this, I mean, when I was going through, you ought to watch PMO from yesterday. I encourage you to go watch it because it'll, it'll scare you to think that somebody could make a video of you fooling around on your wife or you coming out drunk out of a bar or anything like that. People that could be generated and it had your voice, your picture. Your face, your lips moving with it, everything. And it's all fake, computer generated. They can lie about you in a heartbeat, which means they can lie about any, any, they'll lie about politicians. And that's what they talk about. In an election year, watch out because you never know what kind of fake stuff is going to come out about a politician. Now, if they're liberal, believe it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if they lie about it, I don't care if they lie about them, but I'm just saying. The only thing now that we have left to trust in is the Word of God. And if you can't trust 100% in that, I feel sorry for you because you don't have an anchor. You're going to drift. And I've seen many people drift. Amen?